Once, this was the site and the sound of the Negro protest movement. Today, you no longer hear this song of promise. What you hear is a cry of anger and bitterness. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream. I have a dream. Four years have now passed since Dr. King stood on these steps and spoke those words. Yet it all seems so long ago and in some ways so unreal. What happened to the dream? It ended, as all dreams must end, when it confronted reality. Perhaps the nation was living in a dream world. During those years from the Supreme Court school desegregation decision in 1954 to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It was out of touch with reality to the extent that it believed that court decisions and the mere passage of laws would give Negroes true and meaningful equality with all deliberate speed. For when the court decisions had been handed down and the laws had been passed, and Negroes were guaranteed those rights promised all Americans by the Constitution, they were merely brought to the starting line of the race. But when they took their places at the starting line and then lifted up their heads, they found that most of their white countrymen were already 80 yards down the track. But the race had to be run. In the South, where in many rural counties, Negroes outnumber the whites, the emphasis was on voter registration. In registration was power. The Negroes knew it, and so did the whites. And soon the pattern of politics in the South was changed by the very fact that the Negro vote could no longer be ignored. It had become an important factor in Southern politics. We'll bear true faith and allegiance to the same. So help me God. But if there was progress in the South, there was violent resistance in the North. The nation suddenly learned what it should have known, that racial prejudice was not just a Southern problem. It was nationwide. If whites in the North formerly could comfort themselves by pointing an accusing finger at the South, they could do so no longer. School segregation by neighborhood, violence against Negroes moving into all white communities. These were facts, real and immediate. And resistance to Negro demands was every bit as determined in Cicero as it had been in Birmingham. White backlash produced frustration and confusion. This turned in time to disappointment, bitterness, and anger. And this produced counter-reaction, expressed in the call for black power. As a radical movement, it became linked to opposition to the war in Vietnam. Its most articulate spokesman, Stokely Carmichael. The first man in this country to die for the War of Independence was a black man named Christopher Adams. A black man. He was a fool. fool. He got out there and got shot for white folks while his brothers were enslaved all over this country. He should have been getting his brothers together to take care of natural business. (laughs) 
After the American Revolution was over and the white folk got their independence, they tapped the black people who fought on the head and gave them a medal and said, good work, nigga. Now get back to where you belong. So along came the Civil War. And the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln wouldn't even let us fight in the Civil War because he said we weren't fitting to fight. Frederick Douglass had to go and tell Lincoln to let us fight. And they only started to let us fight when the South was winning in segregated units and we fought in the back. We weren't satisfied. Weren't satisfied, no. Along came World War I and they started to draft people and they weren't drafting us. So our organization spoke up, draft us. We want to fight. We good Americans, yes. The slogan was, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. And while our grandfathers and our fathers lined up to make the world safe for democracy, and we didn't even know how to spell the word, and along came World War II. And our uncles went to Poland to fight in Poland, died trying to stop Hitler from killing white Polish people. And last summer, when we walked into Cicero, young Polish punks gonna throw rocks at us and call us niggers. Call us niggers. We weren't satisfied, no sir. We're going to prove what good Americans we were. So the Korean War came along, and communism must be stopped at any price. And it was our blood that paid that price. And our uncles and brothers came back with one leg and one arm to walk into a store and have some foreigners slam the door in his face and say, nigger, get out of my store. Yes, sir, in the Vietnam War, America is going to prove something to us. We ain't fighting. <laughs> There ain't no need for us to go and bomb schools in Vietnam. We need to build schools in our ghettos. That's where we're going to be working. That's where we're going to be working. There is no need to go to Vietnam and shoot somebody who a honky says is your enemy. We're going to shoot the cops who are shooting our black brothers in the back in this country. That's where we're going. There is no need for us to go anywhere and fight for democracy. We're working for our liberation, and it's going to be in this country. It's going to be in this country. In Atlanta, where Carmichael's organization has its headquarters, a warning to Negro extremists from the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, Eugene Patterson, Pulitzer Prize winner and vice chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. Mr. Patterson, in the columns you've been writing lately, the Atlanta Constitution, you seem to be warning the Negroes to not fall in the trap that Southern whites fell into, which is namely violence. What's motivated you? I've been a little worried about the manifestations of black power, which indicate that staying within the democratic process is becoming less attractive to the Negro. I experienced this in the white South, where the difficulty of ending segregation led many whites into outside the democratic process and into violence. I think this led to their self-defeat. I think it always will in this country. Several years ago, you wrote a memorable editorial after the bombing of the Birmingham church in which four little girls were killed. And they found the shoe of one little girl. And the editorial was called, We Hold This Shoe, meaning that all of us who don't condemn violence in a way contributed to that. Is it possible that you might be writing one day the same kind of an editorial about Negroes who commit violence? Uh, I would hope that the Negro in America would also remember those days because the democratic process, the institutions of this country, I think, have been sufficient to give a start toward a better break in life for the American Negro, and I'm convinced will bring him full equality and justice ultimately. I recognize his reasons for being impatient. I'm not against impatience. I'm not against protest. I'm not against any group in America, and certainly the Negro has, who has so far to come. I'm not against this man demanding his rights and working toward them and bringing pressures to bear for them. But what I'm saying is that when you carry any uh, group of Americans across the boundary that separates the democratic process from the jungle. 
Uh, when you threaten to burn a city or to shoot a man, when you threaten violence, uh, either by implication or outright, then I think you're contributing to the defeat of whatever cause, whatever cause, moral or immoral, it is that you are attempting to champion. I've heard so many definitions of black power in this country, but I'm not sure really what it is. I think black power is probably uh, pretty much what Dr. King was preaching uh, five years ago, which is political unity. Get the vote. Use the vote to gain your rights. Develop pride in self. Uh, uh, develop uh, a, a sense of history. Uh, develop a willingness to solve your own problems and stop leaning so much on the white man. But I think also that you have to stay within certain bounds, that you have to realize that there is a point of diminishing return in most affairs in life. And this includes protest movements. And so in the time of hard work that lies ahead, I would uh, like very much to see more of a dialogue within the Negro community itself on this issue of violence and nonviolence, racism and brotherhood. We are still too divided by race in this country. And I think every step we take to fragment it and divide it further is a step toward folly for the American people and the American institution. And I think every step we take toward integration, toward brotherhood, toward working together, toward absorbing the 20 million Negroes right into the great melting pot of this nation, then I think we're on the road toward the light. But now some white youth are hung up with democracy because they're deluded and they think there really is such a thing as democracy in this country. And so they begin to stop the war on questions of morality, that it ain't right to kill. Now that's a lot of junk. It's not either right or wrong to kill. Killing is. The question is, who has the power to kill? That's all. A policeman in a black community is a licensed killer. The licensed killer. A black man attacking a policeman is a rioter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's because the black man don't have the license to kill. But when I die, I'm going to die with my boots on. And it's going to be in this country. And it's going to be fighting for what I know is right. The liberation of black people. Nothing else. Nothing else. And what we're going to say across this country, from Muhammad Ali to the little black boy in Cordoza High School, hell no, we won't go. Stokely Carmichael's voice is the most strident. But there are other voices of black power. And in a minute, we shall hear some of them. This is where it began, the rural South. And here where it began, for the Negro, the problem remains. There's no ghetto here, just poverty. The worst kind of poverty. The kind of poverty that you won't find in even the most depressing ghettos of the North. The kind of poverty that makes you wonder, can this be the United States of America, the richest country in the world, in the year 1967? It is not just material poverty. There is also a poverty of the spirit. But it is changing. There is a quiet Negro revolution going on in states like Mississippi, in hundreds of hamlets, places that Southerners call wide places in the road, where you can see it, you can feel it, and you can hear it. The revolution is quiet. It is also armed. Churches have been bombed and burned too often. Thank you very much. We don't believe in black power. That's the wrong word. <laughs> That's a dirty word. But we believe in, it just happened that we have what? We just happened to accidentally have population power. And we're here because we're concerned about getting a share. It's going to be fair and square with all of the citizens. Charles Evers is the NAACP field director in Mississippi. The man who had the job before him was his brother, Medgar, killed in an ambush in the summer of 1963. And we're here to serve notice on all of those who have been so brutal to us in the past. That your day is gone. Yeah. Be 
because here in Jefferson County, we outnumber you any way you come. We got you outnumbered physically, we got you outnumbered mentally, and we got you outnumbered economically, and about to outnumber you politically. We've got to vote right, walk right, and talk right, and let America know that we're not going to let nobody turn us around. To start off with, we let them know that we're going to take down that old Confederate statue we got standing down. We're going to put a statue of a man who lived and died for all Americans. And somebody like maybe George Washington maybe Medgar Evers or somebody who died that all men may be free. Evers does not call for black power. Instead, he uses the power of blacks. In five counties of southwest Mississippi, where blacks outnumber whites. In Fayette, in Jefferson County, where Evers lives, he's built a shopping center modest by white standards, but significant as a symbol of the growing Negro economic and political power in Mississippi. White politicians, aware of this growing power, openly seek Negro support in the August Democratic primary, in which Negro candidates are also running. Along with political power, the Negroes possess economic power, which can be dispensed or withheld. Evers is leading a boycott in nearby Natchez in an effort to get white merchants to hire more Negroes and the city to grant greater Negro representation on the police force, the fire department, and the school board. The current boycott is already having its effect. Negro housing in some parts of Mississippi is unbelievably squalid, but even this is slowly changing. Credit, a commodity always difficult for Negroes to obtain, suddenly has become easier to come by. The Farmers Home Administration, an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, is granting low-interest, long-term loans, which are being used by Negroes to build decent homes. But the building is not just a matter of new homes. It's also a process of developing the Negroes' abilities. The steaming journalists of French Equatorial Africa welcomed the young German doctor and his wife. The year was 1913, and the pair had come to minister to the natives who had never known any other medical treatment that was given by the local witch doctors. They set up their As part of the effort of self-improvement, Negroes are taking advantage of literacy programs. This one conducted by STAR, a private, non-profit organization operating in Mississippi with funds from the Federal Poverty Program and encouraged by Charles Evers. You and Africa. All right, pause for a minute now. That is strife. Let's go again. Read again his label. His label of love in the jungle was made doubly hard, hard by the outbreak of war and strife. strife both in Europe and Africa. At the site of the old slave block in Natchez on the Mississippi, where Negroes once were bought and sold, Charles Evers talked about the New South, which his power is creating. We're now working strongly on our, in our areas and politics, getting them registered getting them qualified, having voter education, voter registration, and uh, the importance of the, of, the, of the vote and what it can do. And this is already has changed the, the gubernatorial you know, old pattern, pattern where there used to be nigger, 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 now they're talking about better highways and better education and more industries. So you see, this is when the politicians, Mississippi politicians are funny. They look at two things, the ballot and the dollar. And in this area, we control both. Yeah, but you still go around with a gun. Uh, how much has really changed in Mississippi if you still go around with a gun in your car? Well, I don't want you to get the impression that it's changed that much. Sure, I have a gun. It's, uh, I have two guns. I have a rifle and, and, a, and a 38. And it's all for my protection. And I still feel I'm going to get it sooner or later anyway. But we had to stay on and, and continue to fight for the thing that we know is right. Because... In every great movement, men have had to give their lives, and families have had to suffer. I'm going to live as long as I possibly can, and when I can't live any longer, then I'm going on in. How do you feel about the situation with the war in Vietnam and some Negro leaders urging Negroes in Mississippi not to register, saying if you haven't got democracy in Mississippi, why should you go fight for it in Vietnam? Well, I, I take a, 
different stand, I guess, on that, too. I'm against the war in Vietnam. There's no question about it. I think all of us are. But I take another position that America doesn't belong to the white. It belongs to all of us. And if America is in Vietnam wrong, then we all are wrong. Then we all, I feel that we all should defend our country, not the white man's country. It's our country. And anyone who takes a position that it's a white man's country, then he's been misled. I feel that we should go and fight for America in Vietnam, and we certainly should just come back and fight for it here. Now, I'll, you probably read what I've said, and I mean this, that I'm going to personally ask Negroes in Mississippi not to go to the Army, become June 1st, but not to, de, not to defend our country in Vietnam, but it's because we have 90 selected service boards in Mississippi, and there's not a single Negro on one of them. So what we are saying is, unless Negroes are on the Selective Service Board in Mississippi, we don't feel that it's fair for a little white boy to send Negroes off to the army. What do you mean when you use the word black power? If black power means what I have been told, it means that we're going to take over and mistreat the whites and abuse the whites as they have done us, then we uh, are going to be just as guilty as the white man has been. Did you feel this way before your brother was killed? I'll admit that once upon a time that he and I both admired, and we still, I still admire, Ken Yarda. Uh, I'll admit that once upon a time he and I had planned to do the same type of thing that Ken Yarda had done. And maybe you know his son, his oldest son, his name, Daryl Ken uh, But we found out that that wasn't the way, and it wouldn't do, and that we couldn't win by uh, uh, taking an eye for an eye and a two for a two. So what we found Mau Mau in Mississippi. We, we had once thought about that, but uh, as boy youngsters, because we've been mistreated so badly. And if they, we found that this wasn't the way, because even Ken Yard himself was defeated. And the reason why the whites are losing, because they're wrong. And they can't survive this. So we're going to do unto others, and we'll have them do unto us. We're not going to have anyone who's going to do the white people wrong, either. Uh, this, is, this is what's been wrong all the time. Them dirty rascals have treated us wrong, and... And now we don't get in and treat them wrong. So if we do right, it's going to hurt them bad enough. Oh, yeah, it's going to hurt them bad enough. Because they can't stand to do what's right. Now, maybe some of you don't understand why it's so important and why we run so many justice pieces. Those are the rascals who have done us so bad. Yeah. And we got to eliminate. See, we're going to build a foundation that you can't shake. So this time, let's bring to, for the first time in history, that we know of, a woman, and most of all, a Negro woman, who's running for Justice of the Peace in District 2, Miss Lee. Come on up, Miss Lee. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Oh. We're going to be right by our side, too, when they come in. Mr. Evans, our great leader, to our president, Mr. Allen, to the pulpit guests, officers of the board, and all who goes to make up this group. It is indeed a pleasure for me to stand before you tonight to run as a candidate for Justice of the Peace in District 2. I will give justice to one and all, regardless to the race, the creed, or the color. So let us stand together and let us vote for one another because this is the first time in life that we have had this opportunity. So since we have this opportunity, let us make the best of it. Yeah. So I think. Let's get it live. We gonna do what the spirit can do. So what the spirit can do, we gonna do. Oh no.
In Atlanta, where he was raised as a minister's son, Dr. Martin Luther King seeks to pursue his dream of Negro equality through nonviolence. His leadership has been challenged, and so has his dream. The black man in America is saying in substance that either you solve this problem and make freedom a reality, or you annihilate us. This is the choice that America has. Either uh, exterminate us or make it uh, right for us to live. And that, that it boils down to just that. So, and I don't think that uh, America has degenerated to the point that it will seek to exterminate the Negro. So I think white America is going to eventually adjust uh, to living creatively and brotherly uh, with the Negro. But I do think that we will have to work a long time to get even the English language to the point of really recognizing the Negro or the black man as a man, because everything black in our language is considered low and, and worthless and inferior and degrading. If one would thumb through uh, Roger's thesaurus, uh, you would see 125 synonyms for black, and they are all negative and low and degrading, and 118 synonyms for white, and they're all high and pure and chaste and everything else that you would consider high, noble, and good. But in spite of this, I think that a strong, vigorous, determined movement can force the whole society to begin the process of accepting the Negro as a fellow human being, a person, and as a man. Is this not black power you're talking about? I guess that is, in the sense that uh, it is a psychological call for manhood. Now, uh, I've made it clear that uh, I believe in the concept of black power if it means that, a psychological call for manhood, where the Negro is not ashamed of his heritage, he's proud of it, and uh, where he is not ashamed of being black. Uh, he comes to see that uh, there's nothing wrong with being black, and black is as beautiful as any other color. And if it means an amassing of political and economic power to achieve our legitimate goals, I can go for it altogether. Unfortunately, the slogan black power has some negative connotations, and those I can't go with. Uh, certainly, I can't believe in black separatism, and often this is one of the uh, connotations, and I can't go along with violence. And Unfortunately, some who have used violence and who engaged in riots have shouted black power in the process. A riot ends up creating many more problems for the Negro community uh, than it solves and for the larger community. And certainly you can't establish brotherhood through violence because it only intensifies the fears of the white community while relieving the guilt. You can, through violence, burn down a building but you can't establish justice. You can murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder through violence. You can murder a hater, but you can't murder hate. And what we are trying to get rid of is hate and injustice and all of these other things that continue the long night of man's inhumanity to man. But I find that even the other groups that are preaching violence are willing to go along with nonviolence if they feel that uh, something is being gained through nonviolence. And this is why I say that uh, the power structure often aids and abets a few forces that are preaching violence because the only time they will make concessions in many instances is when Negroes uh, riot. And then they make a few token concessions and give the Negroes the impression that the only way you can get anything in the northern community is to start burning the town down. What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here in chains, treated in very human fashion. And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. 
He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. So that uh, I must say that white America must assume the major responsibility for the Negro's dilemma today. The Negro's dilemma grows out of white America's dilemma. We've got to recognize that the black man is the key figure in America now. You either deal with this problem in America or America can bring down the curtains of disaster and doom on its own civilization. When you stood that August day in 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and you said you had a dream, did that dream envision so soon a war in Asia preventing the society doing for the Negroes that which you think had to be done? No, I didn't envision that then. I must confess that that period was a great period of hope for me, and uh, I'm sure for many others all across the nation. But I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go and that we are involved in a war on Asian soil, uh, which if not checked and stopped, and poison the very soul of our nation. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective, and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history, so that we do face many more difficulties uh, as a result of the war. It's much more difficult to really arouse a conscience during a time of war. Dr. King, do you find it somewhat surprising that so many people should be shocked that a Nobel laureate like yourself has come out against the war in Vietnam? Well, I find it uh, uh, very paradoxical in a sense that people would praise me so strongly and uh, applaud me so vigorously when I say be nonviolent, where Bull Khan is concerned, when I urge Negroes to be nonviolent toward Jim Clark, and yet condemn me so vigorously uh, when I say that uh, our doses of violence in Vietnam, where little children are suffering, where villages and huts are being burned down, are certainly injurious and destructive of many of our values. So there's no alternative. Uh, for me, on the basis of conscience, uh, I must stand up against this war. And just as I'm against segregated lunch counters uh, and segregated public facilities in the House, I mean in the South, I'm against uh, segregating my moral concern. And I'm not going to limit my moral concern to civil rights for Negroes in the United States. I have a humanitarian concern. Without doubting Dr. King's motives, a Negro leader like the executive director of the NAACP, Roy Wilkins, questions the tactics of mixing Negro equality with opposition to the war. All I can say is that in the tactics and strategy of the civil rights movement, which is here and now, not in 1970 or 71, all such uh, devotions to another ideal uh, inevitably detract from the main show. The main show for us is right here, civil rights. It must be remembered in this connection, gentlemen, that the problems that we seek to attack here will not wait for the end of the Vietnam War. They didn't wait for the end of World War II. They didn't wait for the end of World War I. 
If you're going to fight for civil rights, you have to fight it year round, and year, in the year in and year out, no matter what the overriding issue is. We fought it with President Wilson in World War I. We fought it in World War II with President uh, Roosevelt. We didn't back up on civil rights. And we don't see any reason for downgrading civil rights and elevating the peace movement above it, especially uh, the indignities our people are suffering. When Roy Wilkins talks about the indignities Negroes are suffering, he is talking about conditions in cities like Baltimore, where today 40% of the population is black. It has a problem, as all major cities in the United States have this problem. Today, few whites dare enter the ghetto. Most of them are aware of the black ghetto as a place to be avoided, as a place where there is likely to be trouble. Negroes insist that there will be trouble in the ghetto so long as they have inadequate housing, poor schools, high unemployment, and no money. All right, yeah, I am. What you want? Yeah, is that it now? Yeah. Give me some money. You got no money today. Hey, look, look, girl, I don't want no fools inside of you. All right, just give me your number. I got it. There are about 20 million Negroes in the United States. Most of them live like this. Core, the Congress of Racial Equality, picked Baltimore in 1966 as the target city, at a time when everyone said it was ready to explode. When Core came in, most whites feared that the black power advocated by Core meant violence. It has not. In Baltimore, black power has not been a call to violence. It has been a program of constructive action, economic and political, like ghetto candidates running for the first time in local elections. Uh, it all points to the most crucial area, and that is that behind you in every, each one of those areas where you see a number is the heart of political action, and that's where we begin to develop the kind of black political power we're talking about. Many people ask, what is CORE doing? Well, I want them to point a finger at... Baltimore. CORE also has pressed for job equality in Baltimore's major industries. Only when we grasp this weapon of black power, only when we grasp this weapon firmly in our hands can we begin to go forth to the battle. One of CORE's major concerns has been young Negro dropouts, many of them with police records. A program to train them as gas station attendants is carried on with a grant from the Department of Labor and the cooperation of several large oil companies. Each lobe inside the distributor at the proper, proper time. Despite the success in Baltimore, Floyd McKissick, CORE's national director, admits that his organization, like other militant civil rights organizations, is in deep financial trouble. Today, CORE's program in Baltimore is threatened by a lack of funds. Black power, plus his opposition to the war in Vietnam, scares away white support. But McKissick still sees black power as the only way out. Black power is really what we are carrying out here in Baltimore. Unfortunately, uh, black power is a program. It is a philosophy and a program. And a program is really to rebuild a man in a philosophy, build him to learn to love and respect himself and not hate himself because he's not white. I'm saying that we must be exactly who we are, be proud of who we are, be proud that my hair is like it is, and your hair is like it is too. But you respect me because 
I am a black man, and because we have contributed to the goods and the services in this society, and we have given our labor to make the society what it is. What are the manifestations of black power within your project, Target City, like the gas station, for example? Is that a manifestation of black power? Yes. Uh, and this is what a lot of people don't understand. When we talk about economic power, here we mean the organizing uh, of the people into compact units. Some of the gang leaders, uh, ironically enough, who went through the training program, some of the gang leaders, uh, that were supposed to be the most explosive people in the community that were going to start the so-called disturbances in Baltimore, went through the training program, and after coming out of the training program, they were the first people that went back in the community when the Klan marched through last year and got all of the gangs to cool it. And you didn't have any trouble here. The same guys that were going to be the producers of violence turned out to be the very guys who stopped the violence in the ghetto. This is just the way you're going to feel when you go in and start laying your story down to get the job. Now, this is the exact same atmosphere. You're going to be a little nervous. You're going to feel a little uneasy. But I want you to watch one guy that's been doing it, and he knows just how to get the story down, and we're going to check him out to see if he's got it down pat. So let's give a listen for a second. John, come on. Let me see how you make up. Good afternoon, each and every one. My name is John Abel. And I am speaking on behalf of the Target City Youth Program. And I am also a trainee. I'd like to say, being in here 10 weeks, awfully really have learned me a whole lot in this little bit of time. And I believe that I'm also eligible enough to be a manager or a owner of my own service station. It's no good walking around the street wondering what can you do. You have to learn and earn and stick with what you have started. It's no harm in trying. Anybody can say they can't do it. But to my opinion, I think I'm ready to be a manager. Thank you. OK. First of all, remember, he's a pro. He's supposed to know how to do it. Now, let's see just how good he was. We're going to get a few comments. I want you to tell me what you think he did wrong. Come on. Well, to the knowledge, to my knowledge and my fact, I do not think that he did anything wrong. Everything was perfect. He put enough life in it, but he could have put, say, about an inch more life in it. OK, all right. Well, uh, to my opinion, his presentation was so uh, realistic and so nice that if he runs for president, I'd vote for him. You see, we live in two worlds. We got a black world and a white world. And we have never understood and most people don't understand how I think because they think I should think the way that they think. Now, a kid born in this neighborhood can't think the way that a white man thinks. You see, a white kid thinks. We've developed what you call defensive thinking in order to make it in a society where we are oppressed daily in everything that we do. And these two worlds uh, have not been able to come together and get a meaningful dialogue. And even when we really tell the truth, if the truth hurts, it's not accepted. So here you have the ghettos this summer where, where people feel that nobody listens to them. Black people feel rejected. They feel like they're being pushed into a corner. They can't get anyone's ear. They have a failure to support them in their endeavors and undertakings. And the youth feel totally rejected. They feel that there is no hope. There's not a chance. It's a matter of hopelessness. It's frustration. I'd just soon be dead, some of the kids say. I, I, that's the attitude that they take. Uh, we, on one hand, we say, let's be nonviolent. The whole civil rights struggle ought to be nonviolent. On the other hand, we use violence, this society uses violence, to accomplish most of its goals, or the majority of its goals. This country was taken by violence from the mother country, and then by violence we destroyed the Indians, and now, by violence, we are fighting another war, and that's the Vietnam issue. We know that the white man has the guns. Everybody knows that. And what we are fearful of right now, and we wonder if there's not a, a commitment and a hope that riots will occur so that they can shoot down black people in the streets. And what we're really 
have not recognized is that there is now thought control over the black man. They say, you are wrong and we don't support you because you don't think like us. You ought to support the war. And of course, I don't believe in supporting the war. So they said, we don't like that about him, which means that they aren't respecting me for my difference of opinion, my ability to think and come to a different conclusion. I must think the way that he says that I must think. So we lose support for that reason. Uh, some people say we don't like your position on Adam Clayton Power. Well, Adam Clayton Power was the only man that we had in Congress to represent us. Out of 22 years of buying Adam on installment plan to send him up there to talk for us, you take that away from us. And then they expect us to be happy and they withdraw funds. Uh, I think they've got to recognize, we go right back to the same point, that they have got to let the black man develop his independent pattern of thought, which is going to sometimes hurt him in a sense because we don't think like him, but it certainly uh, ought to be that uh, the understanding that we are never going to think of like in all aspects, not until all other things are equal. It is difficult for a white man to talk about black power. One reason is obvious. He's not black. The other reason is less obvious. Black power right now is a kind of disembodied phrase with many shadings and definitions. It means one thing to some Negroes and something else to others. There is no such thing as yet as a Negro community, some great monolithic political and social entity poised in anger and frustration ready to storm the barricades of white America, screaming black power. The war in Vietnam has also complicated the white problem of understanding black power. The phrase has become most recently identified with opposition to the war. Blame or credit for this can be given Stokely Carmichael. He's the Negro leader whose views on the war are the most radical, but his views are not those of Dr. King, whose views in turn are different from Floyd McKissick's. And even if the war ended tomorrow, and whites would still be confronted with the Negroes' search for black power, which seems to be now, after civil rights, the next phase in their struggle for true and meaningful equality. There are, however, in the search for black power, two elements which white America should be able to understand. One is that Negroes are not searching for something which is alien to our system. All minority groups in this country at one time or another have sought to better their condition by demonstrating their collective power, real or imagined. But what is alien and what will not be understood or accepted is the black power which advocates violence to achieve its aims. The other element is a common denominator among the advocates of black power, and that's a new pride in being black. It's part of a search for identity. You find it especially pronounced at Negro colleges and universities, which 10 years ago formed the backbone of nonviolence, and where in the next 10 years, black power may be given coherence and form. The only thing which is radical about this search for identity is that many Negroes are no longer willing to be what whites would wish them to be. And that may be precisely what makes so many whites fear the words black power. The other day, the law school had its talent show. And you know what turned out the talent show? Some sisters and brothers from the church who came to sing gospel to us. And we were pretty and we felt good because that was our heritage. And we are not white, we are black! <laughs> and as black people, we must act according to our nature. You can't teach a snake not to crawl on its belly, nor can you teach a baboon not to sit on its haunches, because that's his nature. And it's nature for black people to have soul. And we exhibit that soul in various and sundry ways. Why do you think those brothers and sisters come out here on Friday and sing around that tree? Because that's the way we do things. And we can't be ashamed of that, because if we're ashamed of our culture, we become manifestly ashamed of ourselves. And brother, I'm not ashamed of myself, because I'm beautiful. <laughs>
Sitzer. 